This video is brought to you by Keeps. Hey Wisecrack, Michael here, and today we're talking about the best witch-centric program since Charmed. That's right, WandaVision. The show is definitely a deviation from typical Marvel properties. The majority of the show is a tricksy and sometimes downright trippy delve into one woman's grief at the loss of her robo-boyfriend. The show also parodies American sitcoms, ranging from oldies like I Dream of Jeannie all the way to Modern Family, which had us wondering. Why is WandaVision set in the world of classic sitcoms? Fred and Linda are building a moat in a fully functioning Port Collis and no one even knows why. Then what does that have to do with Wanda's grief and trauma? And most importantly, can the show tell us anything about the future of the MCU? Let's find out in this Wisecrack edition on WandaVision, how we cope with trauma. Oilers ahead for WandaVision and the MCU at large. Before we tackle this gigantic franchise, we're gonna take a second to shout out this week's sponsor, Keeps. If you know someone who is bald, then you know that it's a bold style choice and some guys just don't wanna rock it. It can make you feel insecure to lose hair, but prevention is key, so the sooner you act, the more hair you could save. Keeps is a subscription service that focuses on making it easier and more affordable to get your male pattern baldness treated online. You'll meet with a real doctor online, automate shipping, and get everything delivered to your home so you never have to stress about in-person appointments or going in to grab your refills. Keeps offers the generic versions of the FDA-approved medications that are made for hair loss. That makes it more affordable. The process is so simple that you should try it out for yourself today. Take action and prevent hair loss by going to keeps.com slash wisecrack or click the link in the description to get 50% off your first order. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash wisecrack. Now, back to the show. WandaVision tells the story of Wanda Maximoff, the MCU's most important character. I don't even know who you are. Okay, so she's been a bit of a side character up to this point, though one who's been royally screwed over throughout the Infinity Saga. Her parents were killed by a Stark Industries bomb. Her brother was killed by Ultron. Then she had to kill her robot boyfriend to save the world, only for Thanos to turn back time and kill him again right in front of her. Wanda had already been through a lot, even before she tried to give Vision a proper burial, only to see him being disassembled for parts by the government. So maybe it's no surprise that she decided she'd had enough of this world and created a new one for herself. I mean, who hasn't been there? And this is what we find really interesting, because in creating a perfect but still creepy reality in, of all places, New Jersey, the show bears a strong resemblance to a very real kind of theater. Now, the show is clearly creepy, but we don't actually know just how creepy, at least at first. While the first three episodes crib the cheery aesthetic of classic sitcoms, there's something very off. Oh, Arthur, stop it. And as the season progresses, the residents of Westview start to question the nature of their existence. The details of their lives are muddy at best. Their neighbors and coworkers are more like caricatures than real people, and the laws of logic and physics don't seem to apply. This arguably makes WandaVision feel less like a typical episode of I Love Lucy, and more like a genre of theater called the theater of the absurd. In the aftermath of World War II, European playwrights like Samuel Beckett, Eugene Ionesco, and Arthur Adamov started writing plays that didn't really make sense, but that was the whole point. Theater critic Martin Eslin coined the term theater of the absurd to categorize these plays, which he described as a veritable barrage of wildly irrational, often nonsensical goings on that seemed to go counter to all accepted standards of stage convention. The laws of probability as well as those of physics are suspended. People in these plays frequently seem like mere marionettes, helpless puppets without any will of their own. Not unlike this. As Eslin puts it, as a result, it is often unclear whether the action is meant to represent a dream world of nightmares or real happenings. This pretty accurately describes WandaVision, and by that, we mean WandaVision's show within a show, which is enjoyed by a small audience of federal agents inside of a tent. The most famous absurdist play is Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot, in which two characters spend the whole play, you guessed it, waiting for someone named Godot to show up. We never learn who they are, how they got there, who Godot is, or why they're even waiting for him in the first place. In my opinion, we were here. You recognize the place? I didn't say that. Well, that makes no difference. This sounds not unlike two superheroes inexplicably wondering why a calendar date is marked. Well, don't tell me you have forgotten, Viz. Forgotten? 
A wonder I'm incapable of forgetfulness. I remember everything. Or an audience wondering why two Avengers are now living in a black and white sitcom. Who are those people? What are you wearing? Why are they here? What are you wearing? Well, it's our anniversary. Although, to be fair, they get to that later. The abandonment of traditional characters and plots in absurdist theater is meant to highlight the ultimate futility of mankind's existence. As Esslin writes, the spectators of the theater of the absurd are thus confronted with a grotesquely heightened picture of their own world. A world without faith, meaning, and genuine freedom of will. We moved from... And we were married. Yes, yes, we were married in... Well, moved from where? Married when? All that said, it's important to note the ways in which WandaVision is not absurdist theater. We eventually find out that Wanda is actively creating and controlling the sitcom, and filling in the details as she goes, which explains all of the nonsense. But we think there's something deeper about her attempt to create a sitcom a genre in which the world makes sense and where values are clear and consistently reinforced. Using television to escape the messy, absurd world is, after all, something Wanda's been doing since she was a kid. It seems that even in Wanda's native Sokovia, a fictional, vaguely Eastern European country, this vision of the ideal family life allowed people to escape their grim realities for one in which problems easily resolve at the end of an episode. So then they can is like problem, but more silly than scary, but can sometimes be a little scary. Yeah, like uh, mischief. But a silly mischief that always becomes fine. But despite Wanda's best efforts to create an orderly world where everything makes sense, she instead creates something closer to an absurdist play, where nothing makes sense and meaning is hard to grasp, if it exists at all. I only remember feeling completely alone empty out just endless nothingness nothing to be done i'm beginning to come around to that opinion much like wanda herself the european playwrights behind the theater of the absurd experienced the effects of war firsthand so when they went to write plays that expressed their trauma they found that traditional theatrical conventions didn't quite cut it as eslin explained at the time the loss of a sense of control over rational human development in an age of totalitarianism and weapons of mass destruction have all contributed to the erosion of the basis for a dramatic convention. Similarly, when Wanda tries to create a world where meaning is clear and problems are easily resolved, she instead creates one that's even more meaningless than the one she left behind. In the process, she finds that her problems can't be solved by sitcom escapism. I have. No answers. <laughs> I, zip, zero, zip. Not a niente. <laughs> I'm starting to believe that everything is meaningless. In trying to become a sitcom showrunner and star, Wanda inadvertently creates a piece of televised absurdist theater for an audience of, well, mostly just Darcy. So is Marvel trying to show us the futility of trying to make a neat and ordered world amidst the chaos of the universe? Maybe. And if so, that's definitely a change of pace for the studio. For over a decade now, the MCU has sold us on the idea that heroes are worthy of our faith, even if they are flawed in their own ways. The lines between right and wrong and good and evil are always pretty clear in Marvel films, and even when they do get blurry, we can be sure a bad guy did the blurring. And the Avengers? They went home. I knew I couldn't kill them. More powerful men than me have tried. But if I could get them to kill each other. Now, with its two biggest heroes out of the picture, is Marvel trying to explore new worldviews? Does this dabble into the absurd mean we're going to see an MCU that's less black and white? That's what Theater of the Absurd did, at least. Eslin writes, The theater of most previous epochs reflected an accepted moral order. To such audiences, right and wrong were never in doubt, nor did they question the then accepted goals of human endeavor. That pretty accurately describes the MCU prior to WandaVision. Now, we haven't been through another world war. Yet. But the characters of the MCU have. 
and they're all dealing with that trauma in different ways. Between the Marvel properties we've seen since Endgame, it seems that the studio is actively choosing to focus on that trauma, and in doing so it has, intentionally or otherwise, invoked similar feelings of post-war depression. Where the MCU used to be a world of clear moral dichotomies, with one team of good guys and one group of bad guys, Phase 4 so far has brought us a lot of heroes that sometimes act like villains, and villains that make some pretty good points. Bravo! Much like Absurdist Theater points out the impossibility of a clear moral universe that our naive child brains desperately long for, it seems like the MCU is admitting that things might not be as simple as Captain Good, Thanos Bad. And the fact that the studio is willing to explore such a worldview, and the fact that the show was such a success, hopefully means they'll be willing to take more risks on artists that want to genuinely question the moral absolutism of the Avengers era. And hopefully, we'll see a lot more of up-and-coming actor Ralph Boner. Boner. <laughs> but what do you guys think? Is the MCU entering its own post-war period? Or was WandaVision just a brief intermission in an ongoing stream of costumed kickassery? Let us know in the comments. Big thanks to our patrons for all your support. Hit that subscribe button like you're casually hexing an entire city, and don't forget to ring that bell. And as always, thanks for watching. Later.